Welcome back. It's soul to soul, where every heart to heart conversation can lead to a soul to soul revelation. My name is Wayne Marinta. Glad to be back. This is number three in our series of 12. And I'm continuing with my afterlife experience stories and my recovery from trauma in the hospital. Uh, Last time I left off saying that uh, I had a terrible life when I was younger. It wasn't that bad. It was horrible as a child, but it got better and better. And what I couldn't understand was all the need for the drama in my life. What was I supposed to experience that I wasn't catching on to? Others had mentioned to me that, well, maybe I was missing something. I did a serious study right up to the month before I had moved into London and uh, was getting ready to go back to school, I had really hit the books. I had read everything from the Book of Revelations, uh, history, you name it, science. I was self-teaching myself because I felt if I didn't get an adequate academic degree, I'd have to continue to be a salesman and that was not what my life was about. I didn't know what it was about. I had no idea. All I knew was I love life, I love the love, I love being loved. I wanted it to continue, but I wanted it to be better, higher quality, better values. So I tried to instill those in my life. I was an honest person. I refrained from serious drinking, that kind of thing. I never did drugs. But I was alone and unhappy even when I got married, unfortunately. My daughter was born. I was a happy guy, and I loved being with her. But going back to school, it was necessary. Nothing to be avoided. I'd like, you to, rec I'd like to recall a statement I made uh, about our souls in process. I suggested that we are all here to be wise to our true nature, our hidden nature, our soul's unique sentient nature. By sentient, I mean a sensitive response to impact. And that would be that we're impressionable beings. We gather information, we process it, we make sense out of it, we make conclusions. We live off those conclusions till proven correct or incorrect. We alter them, we change them, and we keep adding new theories to our life as we go along, never really understanding what the whole picture is or what the big picture is. That's our lot, that's everyone's lot. We come in blank slated, but what we don't realize is that we're born with a host rhythm, meaning that when we choose to come here, before we come here, our souls, quite conscious, quite aware, experiencing clarity, we make decisions on the best way forward for ourselves to achieve our higher goals on the spiritual side of life, which just is the only real life this is a temporary uh, solution for a process and a plan that gives us a sense of purpose and a sense of individuality. Not that we needed to gain individuality, but it was the experience of separation. We come in with love and we find a lack of love. But it's the honing device, love itself, our basic primary rhythm that we're born with. Now, if you are a very, very old soul, which I believe I am too. Then you've had a lot of experiences, been blank slated many times, and still chosen to come forward to complete that task. I believe when my experiences were occurring, I caught on to that fact and I was shown past lives, future lives, present conditions, higher states of existence, their relationships, what it is into a formless world of creativity and invention that I could never have imagined on my own, or read, or even considered being inspired about it. I had no way of knowing this. But I did experience it, and it left me to understand something. That we're born with the ability to experience everyone else's experience. I can experience your experience if you're willing to tell me about it. I can quietly sit, listen, and take in your full experience, ass assimilate it within my own soul, recognize how a person grows, what happened, if and when, what 
conditions or circumstances entered into that person's educational life or experience that got them to where they are today. I didn't know this quite well, but I knew it as a fact that when we're born, we're born with a host rhythm. That's the rhythm of pure bliss, pure formless wisdom and love, bliss, ecstasy, rapture. We're born with it. We're soothed by it in the womb. As sentient infants, our first breath, when we take in our soul and our chakras ignite, from that moment on, we're highly sensitive beings in a learning process. And I'll get back to that, and that's going to be a major part, a major theme in the upcoming discourses that I will do. But for now, I want to continue in the afterlife story and tell you about my progress, where, where I went from the hospital to where I am today. I think it's very important for your own perspective, that you get a better picture of me. Again, just an ordinary person, nothing unique or special. I'm not that tall, I'm not that wonderful. I'm just an ordinary, moral kind of guy, all right? This is before him. Uh, we all are this way, all of us, but with new experience, new insight, new revelation, new realizations, we can change. And change is not as difficult as we've been led to believe. It's only important, though, that if you're going to make changes in your life, that you understand how those changes are made in memory and conditioning, unconsciousness. So to really understand ourselves, and you don't have to spend a lifetime discovering this, I'll show you in the upcoming films. But for now, I just want you to remember that you were born with a rhythm of love, that all of your pre pre-experiences, all of your experiences previous to this life, no matter how wise you were, how informed you were, how galactic you might have been, how cosmic you might have been, doesn't matter. When you come into this life, you're only left with the primary rhythm of your soul. In other words, if the level of accomplishment is initiated in the soul, it's a tone, it's a feeling. It's like when you're younger, if you say, what was my nature when I was younger? Uh, I was loving, and I love loving, and I love being loved. Yeah, that's my nature. I was never a pessimist. I was an optimist. I was never depressive. I was always excited about new things. So, even in youth, looking back at it, you can tell yourself what your true nature was at birth. And that tells you a lot about what you came here to get and to do. Each of us have a purpose. It doesn't matter who you are. We're all part of the collective consciousness. Some of us have a very specific piece of that puzzle to put together. If you were to go on Gaia, I can name people that I've listened to, observed and watched over the years and really enjoyed watching their growth, watching their development, watching how they put things together, how they build out a process and an idea conceptually and then build it into a realization all in a single weekend seminar. I love that, and I love the information that's available to them. People are not afraid to talk about their soul or to talk about themselves as being divine beings. It's not a disgrace, it's not something to run from, it's not religious, it's real. And that's why I keep religion out of my practice and what I'm doing. I do have a faith-based reality. I was a Christian when I was younger, or a Catholic, and I understood Christianity, and I believed in Jesus, and I loved Jesus. But after my accident, when I met them, when I met actual living spiritual beings, in form, etheric and otherwise, I came to realize what a panorama of opportunity throughout just our local solar system, let alone the galaxies and the universe itself. We are in a process where we are getting educated one experience at a time until we get it right. It's like having a software program. If you decide to build an algor al al algorithm that'll get you information in return, what do you have to do? You have to set up the system so your first algorithm tells you what's going to come. So your belief system is what draws things to you, experiences, people, events. Whatever you believe that's incorrect, your soul is going to go after and say, look at this, look at this, we're repeating this. It wants us to look and to understand there's a significant 
an unnecessarily well-placed concept involved in the experience, but you've got to start looking. What I realized was we were here to discover ourselves through our neighbors, through our friends, through our family. A child experiences its mother. The mother experiences the child. The child absorbs the mother's traits, conditionings, habits. We all do. Our fathers, our brothers, our sisters. We gather from our neighbors and we exemplify it. We try it out. Oh, I'm going to be like Fonzie today. Tomorrow I'm going to be like Superman. The next day I'm going to be like Zorro. Maybe another time I'll act like I'm Atlantis and I'm trying to save myself from drowning. These are wonderful things that we usually ignore that's in the template of our growth. Curiosity, wonder, the things that draw us towards creative talents. These are our sentient gifts. We're all born with them. And the one thing that you can do that you didn't know you could do is you can assimilate other people so well that you can read their soul. That's correct. And I found that out sitting in the hospital. As I said before, I was in recovery. They had come to me and said, we're going to take out your lung. Oh my goodness, I didn't want to lose my lung. I could barely breathe as it was. I would pass out just trying to sit up. My blood pressure was impossible. I had uh, a pancreatic fistula, which gave me a fever for over three, maybe four years at 101 to 104. My body was on fire. The fluids in my lower abdomen had been mixed with a swell of residue from the, from the accident, blood, internalized scarring. But there was a fistula that kept spewing out toxic waste from the area of my pancreas. So they thought I wasn't going to live. They didn't know if I'd make it even a year. And so getting my voice back and surviving was wonderful. But I want to go back to the, the time that I had my, they were going to take out my loan. I was in my room the next morning, contemplating it before they came on the x-ray. And in walks this woman, a nun. And she was wearing uh, white rather than black. I looked at her and I couldn't talk. So I motioned to her, hello. She came over to my bedside, looked me right in the eye. I never took her eyes off of me, actually. She leaned over and she said, how are you? Well, under the circumstances, I'm okay. That's what she got. She goes, well, you don't have to talk. I've got something for you. I looked at her and I'm not Catholic anymore. At least, I, no, I'm not. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll just be kind to her. And I'll look at her as a soul and try to read her and see what this is all about. So as I'm gazing at her, and she reaches into her, her dress and pulls out a little bottle of water. She goes, this is from Lourdes. Now, if you don't know what Lourdes is, it's a place where a miracle happened, and people often go to Lourdes to find healing through immersion in the water. And it's said that the Virgin Mary, uh, the Immaculate Conception, something about the Virgin Mary, she showed up and the water was after that healing. Well, she had collected a few bottles on her trips back and forth, she told me. And this was the last one she had. But I was a very special case, she told me. Okay. So I thought she would take a couple drops, say a prayer, maybe bless me, sprinkle it on me. But she took it and poured it all over the top of my dressings, everything right on my chest. I had tubes sticking out, I had tape all over me, I had a bag on this side for my pancreas. I had all kinds of problems. But she just poured it right out. And I thought, oh, I hope this works. I smiled at her, I looked at her, and she goes, you know who you are? I said, yeah, well, okay. I won't be seeing you again for a while, but I will come back. Thank you, she left. But a half an hour later, my nurse, who had been taking care of me on a daily basis, she came in for her shift. She looked at me and she goes, are you ready to have your lung taken out? And I said, oh, no. I started writing very quickly. I told her about the visit. I showed her what she had done. She goes, what? So I said, 
I wrote down, please get them to do an x-ray before they take me down. I think it'll be better. And why? I think that this was healing. Oh, okay, I'll tell the doctors. So she went off, told the doctors. An hour later, they came in and he says, so I hear you had a visitor. I said, yes, you know, nodded. He goes, well, we don't have nuns in the hospital. Okay, so was she a friend of yours? No, I'd never met her before. You sure? And what was she wearing? So I wrote down, no, we've had nuns come through, but no, not in white. I've seen the ones in black with the white bonnets. I've seen them without their formal dress, and they wear usually a black cassock or blue. Some of them wear a headscarf. That was a new thing. Oh, well, this one was in her full habit. She had a cross on her, and it was very beautiful, and it was ornate. She had a, a heart in the center of that cross that looked like it had the crown of thorns around the middle of it, but it was brilliant light, and it was built right into the bust instead of a man hanging on a cross. I wrote that down, and oh, okay. Well, maybe it helped. He was being optimistic, assuring. I knew it. Of course, he discounted the, the potential. But a couple hours later, they wheeled in an x-ray machine, managed to lift me up in the air just enough before I passed up that they could slip the x-ray unit behind my back while I'm laying down. So I got this machine over me, and it's taking x-rays. They pull it apart. They come back an hour later. Uh, we haven't got the results yet, but we'll get back to you tonight. Okay, scheduled surgery is scheduled for tomorrow at 8 a.m. Oh, okay. I didn't get depressed. I was still happy about everything that had happened to me. I was still quite enthused uh, and encouraged because I, I remember they told me, I've got 12 years. Well, that means that I'm going to make it. But, okay, I trust. I just trust. I let it happen. That, uh, that night and then the next morning, the, the nurse came in and talked to me. My friend came in in the morning. My doctor showed up. And he said, we've got the uh, reports. We're not going to take out your lung, but we have to do some bedside surgery. So he explained, so we're going to put in chest tubes on both sides of your chest. He said, on this side, where it's all swollen, he said, when I pop it, you're going to smell something awful. And it's going to be painful. Even though we got a pain reliever, I got it right here. He showed me the needle. He says, as soon as it begins to hurt, I'm going to stick that in your leg and it'll all go away. So you'll have a second or two of pain. Said, okay, their attempt to prepare me. So I waited. Sure enough, he stuck in the chest tube, went through right my skin, into my ribs, right into the lung, and then poof, all this stinky, stinky smell came out. And it reminded me. When I came back into my body and I was choking, I remember the taste, and it tasted like death. There was a, a drab, ugly taste to it. It was like a, a foul alcoholic drink. It's the only way I could describe it. I don't know what kind of drink, maybe scotch, but it was foul, foul smelling, foul tasting. I could hardly handle it. But eventually I got used to being back in my body and dealt with the appropriate smells and odors. <laughs> what does that got to do with anything? Well, when they did this to my lung, it was the same experience over again. And the next thing I know, I feel like I'm in a field of light energy. My heart chakra is wide open, and I'm feeling comforted, like I have hands on my shoulders holding me down, but nobody was holding me down. And I felt this energy move through me. And I thought, well, what is this? I feel really, really good. Did I get that shot yet? I looked, and just then he stuck the needle into my leg. He pushed a little bit more, and I felt this pop at the back in my back. It felt like a gunshot. Poof. I went, oh, lost all my breath, almost collapsed, but I was still feeling blissful. What? Is it the drugs? Yeah, we gave you some morphine, and that'll help with the pain. Okay, but it was more than that. About two hours later, they came in, took another x-ray. This is after the bedside surgery. 
pump's still going, bing, 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 drying out blood, cleaning it out, recycling it. And the pressure on the both of the motors on both sides of the bed, I they had to tie me down so I wouldn't move. I remember my feet being cracked and dry, and I lost over 80 pounds. I was like, this is like five weeks into it, and I hadn't eaten nothing. And I was on IV. And there was, it wasn't a, a food IV. It was just a standard IV, not a pick. And it, I remember going through that and thinking, oh my God, what's going on? And they came back and he said, look, something has changed. The abscess seems to be getting better. We don't want to move and take that lobo yet. We're thinking if you can hang in there for maybe three or four more days, there's a good chance that we can, you know, treat this and you might not lose that lump. And I don't great. But you should know that you will lose your ability to breathe because of other things we've noticed. Your other lung is not so good and it's scarred. There's a lot of blood that was in it and it's left scar tissue, adhesions. And so when you try to breathe, part of your lung is stuck to the your rib cage. You hope in time it might clear, but we think it'll lose some of your breathing capacity, at least half, even if we don't take out your lung. Okay, I live with it, I accepted it. And sure enough, I didn't have to have any more surgery on that part, but I did have to have my gallbladder out. And it wasn't until, well, just about two weeks after they had done this with my lung that they sent in a specialist to take a look at my larynx because I was not breathing properly, I was unable to speak, and they wanted to see how much damage had been done. Well, they didn't know in the original trauma when I first came into Emerge that I had a fractured larynx, not at all. And so they decided, well, we'll give you a trach. And I said, okay, that'll help me breathe, all right. But that's when I wondered about being able to talk again. As I said, two years later, I got in contact with the doctor. He contacted another specialist from the States who came up perform the surgery. I was in the hospital for six months just for that because I had a plug in my throat and no other way of breathing except through the trach. And if I lost this, then I'd have to go with covering it up and using one of those hand resonating machines where, hi, right, my name is, that kind of thing. And I didn't want that. I just wanted to be able to talk. Um, so I felt assured that eventually I could and sure enough I did. Now, I got out of the hospital in June of 1981. That's just over two years later. And I had all kinds of pain and problems and fever and gaseous, unusual feelings throughout the lower part of my body that just would not go away and lasted for almost four years beyond that. But I was also doing therapy, speech therapy, and learning how to ah, e, I how to breathe talk. And with each new injection of Teflon, I got a little bit better at it, but it started to affect my breathing again, so they stopped. And what you hear today is what is left today. Thank God. So, we press on. While I'm in the hospital, just before I got out in the last year, I found that as long as I stayed still, I could handle the pain and I could meditate and deal with it. But I was also getting very specific instructions and insights on a pattern of information that I realized after a couple of weeks that it was leading information. It was building. I was getting to another point, but I was learning one step at a time. I thought, what is this I'm learning? I realized, I remember, I, I heard rhythms, rhythm, oh yeah, that was what I remember, that on the other side, our mind doesn't work like it does here. We don't get to close our eyes, daydream, reflect, think about one thing, then another thing, and then turn that off and come back to consciousness. No, your eyes are open, you see what you see, you know what you see. What you see and you experience, you automatically realize. Nothing's hidden. 
it all fills in. You're not missing a thing. Anything you want to know, without having to think, just a hidden desire to know, comes up. Anything you want to think about, shows up. Oh yeah, okay, so rhythm. So I learned and I remember being taught how to escape the pain through meditation, to live in the posture of these holy rhythms, these attributes. So holy love was my first real attribute. And from it I learned humility, graciousness, honesty, all these things. And then finally one day a word arrived. I was given the insight into my very first word, and that word was the truth itself. And I thought, oh, okay. So I went back to meditation. Truth is never less than itself, never more than itself, never above itself, never below, never ahead, never behind. Truth is a perfection, and in such a way that anything that is this true, that is constantly true and will always be true, is an undeniable truth, and it is free from falsity, falseness, deception, that kind of thing. And I was shown, oh, what's true? And I was shown a body of water. Okay, what's true about the water? Well, water is always water, except it changes states. Liquid gas, all the plasma. But it's forever, we drink it. Yeah, and it's reconsume and re and then yeah, recycle and so we're drinking the same water everyone's ever drank on the planet. We're breathing the same air everyone has always breathed. The molecules that we're drinking in our water may have molecules that someone else drank centuries ago. You never know. But that doesn't matter, is it? Each word led me to a greater measure of understanding when it came to interpreting things. How this happened, I was sitting in my bed, partially sitting one day, the bed had been raised for me, and I was listening, looking around the room. I had come out of intensive care, and I was on a regular ward, next to, less to uh, the one intensive, but less critical. But there were people that would arrive in my room from accidents, and they would die, and some wouldn't. And I tried to communicate with them, and just write notes to them back and forth, and. I started picking up on things. One day I said to my nurse friend, I wrote down, the guy in the bed over there in bed B, he's gonna die in three more days. And I think he's gonna die in his sleep, is what I got. Can you move me from the room before he dies? Because the other guy here is gonna die tonight. What makes you think that? I said that I was told, I was shown. What do you mean? So I wrote it down. I was looking at them, and I felt sorry for them. Next thing you know, I'm reading their soul, and it's telling me their story. How much pain, how much sorrow, how much grief, what they longed for, what they desired from life, how sad they were, the whole thing, they just showed up. And I thought, how am I getting this? It was like an echo. If I look at someone, I didn't judge, that was the key. I remember that very specifically. They pointed that out to me several hundred times. I had a tendency to want to evaluate. I said, no, when you get, when someone starts talking to you or expressing themselves, let yourself become them. Become their consciousness, feel their skull. Feel their skull, yeah. Feel their skull, feel their mentality, feel their mental health and feel their physical, then feel their soul at heart. So I did this and I practiced this. Pretty soon I was able to just get an echo and I could think about it on my own away from them for as long as I wanted. I could see all the connections that would happen to them. And because of my afterlife experience, I was shown what they were gonna go through now, what they had missed, what they could have known, what they might have known, and what would follow for them in the afterlife. I thought, well, this is incredible. I, I've got to tell people this, and I'm writing it down, but of course it was just the nurse. No one else cared. So I kept writing, and I kept experiencing, and I kept learning, and I kept realizing that the process I was in was a kind of a, a word technology. Uh, the same thing I'd gone through in the, in the various colors of light. 
I was now going through in real life experience. I'd get an echo, a nurse would come in, say, hi, how you doing? And she turned away and I could catch from her inflection, her intent, her motivation, her habit, her conditioning, all these things. And I'd go well, overwhelmingly, well, wow. Now most people that met me in the hospital thought I was deaf. They'd go, how are you? And, not deaf. Oh, oh, right, mute, right. After a while, they got used to it, and they started to perceive me as an ordinary individual. And when I got my voice back, these same people were completely surprised. Uh, they almost fell off their feet. What? I had no idea that you were like that. What do you mean? I had no idea that without hearing your voice, I didn't really understand you and I never, I guess I made some conclusions about you that I never were incorrect. I thought about it, oh yeah, of course, you, know, you interpreted me the best you could, but you never experienced being me, so you didn't know. Okay, so one of the first realizations I got is that none of us were doing this now. This was a natural experience for us in consciousness. We were intended to have these attributes, the sentient senses, the skills, the organs of perception. I know the heart is an organ of perception. It does all our, our thinking for us, really. It makes all of our conclusions that are certain. It tells us when we're on and we're off, we're right or not right. Our conscience helps us to understand the, the balance and it gives us a, a way, a method of confirming the correctness of our conclusions. So I knew from very early on that every new conclusion I made, I had to be careful with. The feeling that you put into the, I put into conclusions is where the conditioning happens. So if I had a bad attitude and was critical, then that would have been a critical conclusion that would have set off a whole new pattern of continued criticism and egoism. So I was sure to never not to do that. I was completely sure. So every time I did make a conclusion, I would tell myself, so far, that's what I know. And I'd leave it at that. The conclusion was, that's all I know so far. No feelings about it, one way or the other. It's in process. Well, that saved me a great deal of time and headache, to say the least. But finally, when I got out of the hospital and I had gotten used to reading people's echoes, I lived with a couple of friends for a few months before I finally left for Victoria. Two friends of mine that I grew up with that came to the hospital thinking I was a vegetable, they revisited and said they couldn't believe that I was even alive, that I was a vegetable, and they had been told that so they didn't show up. And now they were apologetic. They even brought me into their home. It was amazing. Great friends, Lloyd and Cheryl. I still owe them. I love them very much. But I haven't seen them uh, and that's since 1981. I promised Cheryl when I left that I would make a life for myself, that it was definitely going to be deeply spiritual. I didn't know where I was headed, but I was going to continue. And I assured her that I would be fine and I left, got on a plane, they, they drove me. I had $300 in my pocket, and I began my new life. Of course, I was broke, I lost everything. The money I did have that was left behind, I left with my wife, my ex, at that point. She couldn't understand how I had changed so much in the hospital, that I was no longer Catholic, and uh, certainly did not support the Catholic Church anymore and the belief system was up for grabs. That I was more Buddhist Christian now than I was Christian. And things were different. I didn't even know what I was. I just knew and believed in spirit now. I had undoubted confirmation. That was all I needed, I thought. But I knew it was wrong for me to pursue a further relationship with her because we were so distinctly different, especially after that but I felt horrible about it. Nonetheless, I proceeded on with my life. And over time in Victoria, I met people, got to exchange, communicate with them, practice out my new voice. 
They all understood. They all tolerated me. They all had patience for me. But I would visit them like on a round every day and keep up five or six friendships that I had started. And then I eventually got myself a job driving a limousine so I could practice, continuing practice, to communicate. And it was the money I needed by working one or two days a week that I could pay my rent with because I had nothing. So back to Pooresville, used to that, no problem. I allowed myself to heal every day or as best as I could every day, to meditate and to continue to learn. I knew that this process was not going to stop, that I was learning one thing after another, one word after another. I knew there were 72 words, but I didn't know which one was going to be first, the order of them, the order of events, or even the experiences that would happen that would give me that. I knew betrayal was one of those words, but whoa, I did not want to, I wasn't in a hurry for that one. <laughs> so I continued on. As I proceeded with this echo assimilation, learning how to experience other people's experience when they talk to me, I got very, very good at that, of being a non-judgmental, totally dissociated from myself. I could be that other person to the ninth degree. In other words, I could experience the sameness in them that was in me. I experienced their living soul. Same rhythm as mine, slightly different, same sound, same goals, same aspirations, same point, same purpose, overall, here to be wise. And same circumstances, you start with love and you know, the experience comes. If you can survive it, stay stable, get integrated, organized, then you can discover your true nature. But if your parents aren't teaching you about your true nature when you're younger, who will? I never had that. I never had a book. Even at school, they never taught us about senses, eyesight, how it works, hearing, how that works, how listening and feeling and what feelings were, what rhythms were, none of that, nothing. You just memorize what you learn about the eye and the filament and how the information goes in, gets bounced back into a visual. That's about it. And that was with deeper science. So there was no lessons on how to interpret your mind, your mind use, consciousness. Nobody knew what it was. I couldn't get a definition from anybody. I'd ask people from time to time if they could explain certain words to me. I would ask them, could you explain what you believe to be the meaning of this word? i say, which word? Mm, assimilation. They try. And I found that almost everybody that had a good vocabulary was at heart intuitive to some degree. That all their language and all the things they had realized, all the things they explained, they could feel. So if we said, uh, could you tell me the truth about your habit of passive aggression? They couldn't explain passive, let alone aggressive, beyond a minute. And they couldn't really define it. So they started asking, could you explain what a personality means to you? Oh yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's you, it's, it's me, it's, uh, it's our identity, I think. And then I'd go, what is it? So I started meditating and I realized, not only did we not get the instructions on how to use our senses for the sake of interpretation, we had all the skills, we had these attributes and these organs of perception. Our senses, our heart, our brain, our feelings, every part of our body is a part of our overall information processing system. Yet nobody knew anything about it. Nobody could explain what a personality was. So I hit the books. Psychology 101, 201, 3, 4, I started getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Nobody understood their own language beyond heartfelt. The few that could explain words actually went out of their way to study those words on purpose, linguistics, 
or some connection between languages, interpreting Greek or as, as, um, or Akkadian into Assyrian into Greek into English into French. And so they knew words and then some of their meanings, but even they could not define it in natural expression. So I thought, oh wow, how am I going to ever try to inspire people about their soul? You know, there are people that are in religions who hear about their soul but don't really study it. And so I turned to the Buddhist. When I turned to Buddhism, I picked up books and I started reading about my experience. My first book was uh, was called, I mean, if you remember here, uh, I can't remember her name, Uma Thurman, the actress. Her father, Robert Thurman, wrote a book. He had translated Padman Sambhava, a very highly enlightened former master, very old, but he had interpreted his sutras, his statements that he left for the younger aspirants who are trying to achieve a light body. And so these these were called in English the, uh, the unexcelled yogas and the perfect yogas and the perfect void uh, meditations. I thought, well, that sounds a lot like what I know. The perfect void, the clear wisdom void. Oh, I know what that is. That's the consciousness you experience in the afterlife, in the bardo, in between. Of course, yes, okay. And so I kept reading, and I kept absorbing, and I realized, oh my goodness, there is a step-by-step -step process here that I can identify with, and it's on attainment. But by having read it, it suggests I've already attained. Well, I had attained, for sure, but now, my life was about bringing that into manifestation. The things I did realize now had to be actively a part of my everyday life. My intuition, my consciousness, my clarity, it had to be that I knew it thoroughly so that I never had to think about it again because that's the way we end up. And the process continued. I kept learning new words perishability, incorruptibility, ineffability, and on and on and on. And each word showed me an aspect of our personality development. Finally, in 1991, as I said, 12 years after my accident, I had an initiation where I was actually consciously transformed. My whole consciousness changed. My thinking, my ability to think, my sense ability had been magnified. I had an expanded state of consciousness without the weight of all the previous thoughts. So it was an easy thing to walk around with and just be a knower, but that's when the transcending the mind was the next stage. I had no idea that was gonna be the next stage. But that's exactly what I was shown. And over a number of years, I practiced into it, kept going, and finally in 1985, when I was ready, I locked myself up in a motel room for six weeks. I had made a deal with my guide. I called him Jishul. Uh, I said, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna meditate for six weeks, and I wanna come out with a complete methodology of attainment going from start to finish on how someone having these insights can achieve the same thing I achieved, gracious peace, what they call the Christ consciousness. I want to achieve, I, I want that to be able to teach people how to achieve that in as short a time as possible. And then it all clicked and I heard the bells go off and the music and then thunder, six claps of thunder, one for each week. And sure enough, I got each and every lesson, I wrote it down, I spelled out what I'd have to do in between, and I was allowed to, to eventually realize how I would proceed to become a master of that. Meaning, once I taught someone a part, 
I could see by observing them what they would do with it, what they might not do with it. But if they did, what would happen, what would change before they would learn the next thing. So I found out how to interpret whether or not the person was listening to me. I could observe and see changes, transitions, new balancing, I could, all new kinds of new things. And after I started working with the odd individual, I decided to pick up a couple of people that were interested in disability. And I used to talk about it as just straight assimilation. My best friend, Marcus, he'd say, tell me about that guy. And I'd say, okay. I'd get an echo, and okay, he's da 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 and tonight he's da 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 but until he, if he doesn't change this, he's going to be da 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 and then he'll go broke, he'll hit the bottom of the barrel, he'll get his humility, and maybe before he's done, he'll recover, but he needs to inv invite his soul into his process. And he'd listen to me and go, wow. And then he'd go and talk to the person see what he can find out about them, then he come back and tell me how correct or incorrect I was. <laughs> it was so good that I found that many of my friends started using me for that reason. Unbeknownst to them, I was aware of karma. They weren't. I started talking to them about it, but I started realizing it in their own lives and mine, so I would tell them. Uh, Marcus, you've been going through an experience with this girl for a couple of weeks. And I know you want to know if it's going to work out or not. you got a lot invested in it. But I can tell you that she's not ready for anything serious right now. And she's got a lot of things on her plate. She's a wonderful person. But I don't know if you can... Oh, okay. And sure enough, that's how it worked. Other times they'd say, can you tell me about this or that, lottery numbers. Mm, no, I'm not a psychic. I was an empathic, telepathic, conscious, uh, intuitive. Okay, intuitive empath, something like that. But I've been developing sensory skills, not psychism or mediumistic kinds of things, just straight up everyday psychological skills learning to interpret people, interpret their intentions, their motivations, and what that would lead to. What kind of damage they could do if it was incorrectly understood to themselves, and or how the benefits would turn out towards them. And behind all of it was, again, my goal. How long would it take to teach people how to arrive at this state, and what are the words I need to know? Well, I got them. And I had been you know, teaching everything I had learned up until that point. I had started uh, doing seminars, inviting people to learn self-awareness, self-analysis, in an effort to integrate and discover their nature, their soul. And that worked out well. I even eventually opened up uh, a spa called Grail Springs in Ontario. That was a wellness spa, and it was about alternative health care and the opportunity that I needed, and I knew other people never got if they had been in an accident, to recover. And hoping to be able to help people who were training as healers to get the proper training, develop the right insights, objective workplace mannerisms, attitudes, these kinds of things. But to the general public, I did sessions for a very private group about 30 people for nine years, I taught them everything I knew that they could handle right up to the end of those 49 words. And it was phenomenal. But in the last time that I taught this was in 98, 99, something hit me. Ah, oh, I couldn't believe what I had discovered. Not only had I been given the methodology and the practice and the insights I needed in relationship to the person's mind use, their reactionary, their reactionary conditioning, their habits. But I could interpret, based on the information they were getting, the length of time it would take, how far they would go, with continued inspiration or aspiration, their willingness to participate. But I also realized people were just taking the information in. They were absorbing it not necessarily acting on it to manifest. It's like 
kept the select group and tried to bring them through the process. I stopped teaching in 2000 because I knew I had to. Because now, I'm not teaching the same thing. Something had changed. I didn't know what it was until my son went back to university, or went to university four years ago, putting us at 2013, 14. And so when he left home, I was an empty nester. And I realized I had the potential to either A, accelerate my own process, complete it, finish it, and leave, or continue to be of service through thought form selection. In other words, I would develop through invocation a series of thought forms. I'd look at the world, some part of the world that was at the world wars, always working with children to try to relieve them of the stress, duress, uh, PT, whatever it is that they suffer from, you know, trauma, and I would work in that area rather than individual anymore. And I went into a very, very private completion process. So at the end of all of this, it actually came quite surprisingly in 2015, I was awakened to a, a very secure thing that I had discovered back in 1991. But now it made perfect sense. It's like I reviewed everything and it was all correct, but something stood out that I hadn't seen before. The root of the ego. Oh, genetically, I knew what caused the ego. I knew how to then uh, identify, rid ourselves of that habit and conditioning of ego. The breach of trust between ourselves and our parents, our own sentient world and how to recover that, expand on that, and complete this goal. I was also aware at the same time that we're in a different time period. Right now, we would take a person 40, 50 years of deep study in some Tibetan monastery with the right teachers, or personally, would only take one-tenth of the time individually. In other words, to get to people where I was after 12 years, it's only going to take about 12 months. They just have to have the information correctly, leave it with them. If they act on it, voila, very quick, very efficient. So this is what I'm going to do in the next nine tapes. I'm going to give you the direct classes, the best that I had discovered, the best inspirations, the best insights, but I'm going to show you the process and give you the exact, the over nine classes exactly how to integrate and overcome that egoic development to reintegrate the personality to become one as a soul. So that you can participate in the process that's going on right now. We're in a world of grace and peace and exception right now. Everyone is enabled if they try to. They can directly discover their own truths now without impediments, without ego forcing them off the track, all of this is available. And that's what's coming. The next class I teach will be called Sentiency. And it'll be the first class to you following this, but it'll be my approach to you on how to understand your true sentient nature and how you can begin. And I don't care if you're already mastered, halfway there, or whatever you think of yourself. If you're a beginner, you'll be able to do this. I know you will. And if you need help, I'll have Q&A nights. I'll be able to answer your questions. But this is a process I tested in Hawaii in 2003, the last time I taught, and that worked. It was five months for people, but I did too many classes. They didn't need that many. They would have caught on if I had only done seven or eight. And that's what I'm going to do for you next. After that, when those 12 are done, I'm going to continue to be on my space, but I'm going to open up and talk about current events and how to read through them, see them as they are, the politicians that are involved, the systems that are involved, the people that are involved, what's happening on the street, all around the world, and to let you know what the progression of humanity, what's happening for the humanity in this time period, as well as giving you tremendous insights over the last 40 years about our actual process and what we've all gone through and what key individuals were responsible for initiating those things. It's really going to be wonderful. 
And if you miss this, you miss it. But if you are already watching, now is the time to start paying attention to the next class because it's going to be the most informative, the best presentation I can give you with the most amount of clarity, least amount of, uh, of concern. You will be able to understand it. You will be able to achieve your goal. You will find out who you are by the end of it. You'll have undoubtable confirmation about your true nature. And it'll be up to you what you will do to act on that after. But that's how we're going to start. That's so I'll see you. This will be number four when I come back. And I thank you for having the patience to listen to me this far. And because you've already listened to me this far, I know you're going to participate. And believe me, everyone needs to hear this. So please share with your friends. Like, subscribe, come and, come and talk to me, send me an email, give me a call, private session. Whatever your direct spiritual needs are, you want to talk about it, we're going to have people that we can converse with and talk at length about a variety of different subjects. But I want you to know these things first. So you can do what I'm doing. Sit back, listen, understand, and respond. Now you can apply it in your own life. I thank you for listening. Gracious peace. I'll see you next time. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you.